I think this specialty has evolved um, in several ways. One is that as we progress from a less developed country to a more developed one, the type of infectious diseases that we are seeing is very different from, say, 50 or 100 years ago. And so the concept of infectious diseases as a specialty has certainly changed. Many people think of infectious diseases as something to do with developing countries, tropical diseases, diseases of the poor and underserved. And certainly the specialty is much, much broader than that. So I would say that one of the major fundamental things that has changed is the recognition of infectious disease as a much broader entity than just tropical diseases. So now we encompass the whole range from tropical diseases, parasitic diseases, of which truly in Singapore we see very little, to that of more of a developed country and uh, so the whole issue about infections in immunocompromised people such as those getting chemotherapy, uh, some kind of immunosuppressive therapy, as well as healthcare associated infections. So in that sense, I would say that one of the major things that has changed has been the whole entity has broadened a lot. And that has been good because people no longer think of it as just uh, a specialty that is dying because it's dealing with tropical diseases or parasitic diseases that don't uh, exist anymore. I think an infectious disease physician, ideally, should be someone who has a broad understanding of many diseases. And I think because we don't have we always say that we are not organ-specific, uh, unlike, say, other specialties which concentrate, say, on the brain or the heart or the lungs. We actually have to think of all organs. So I think the hallmark, one of the basic hallmarks of an ID physician should be someone who has a broad general, general approach to diseases or conditions. So I would say that's number one. The second hallmark, I would say, to be a good ID physician is that one has to be quite comprehensive and um, detailed in getting histories and story almost to the extent of being obsess obsessive compulsive and much much more so than say other specialties where people would zoom in quite fast into laboratory tests or radiological investigations, I think that an ID physician first and foremost must start with, with understanding who the patient is and thinking of very, very broad differential diagnosis. And as, again, I would say being fairly obsessive in trying to get a good history. Something which, um, you know, perhaps uh, is a little bit uh, lacking nowadays. I think in our fast-paced world, people are trying to zoom into diagnostics very fast. And I would say, I would say those would be the two main um, characteristics that we like to see in a good infectious disease physician. Infection control is actually relatively new um, in infectious disease, not just in Singapore, but I think uh, even worldwide, let's say in the US, probably started evolving in the early 1970s or 80s when people started to recognize that more needed to be done about transmission of infection as, as well as its prevention. And uh, so it is, it is relatively, relatively newcomer, even internationally and not just Singapore. I think uh, in Europe, one might say that the Europeans have always been very uh, interested or concerned about infection control. I think if you talk about to European uh, specialists, um, they have always en emphasized the concept of hygiene. And that is, is fairly equivalent to infection control. So the Europeans um, probably were in on the, on the idea or on the game, probably perhaps even earlier than, say, across the Atlantic. How did it evolve in Singapore? I think Singapore 
probably in the 1980s, uh, late 18, 1980s, when the uh, Ministry of Health then set up or told hospitals to set up infection control committees. And that's interesting because infection control committees were set up before there were actually enough infectious disease physicians to go around. So I think many hospitals here, as well as overseas and, and um, particularly in uh, UK-based uh, 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 centres, or, or centres that follow a, a UK um, model, many, many infection control people were microbiologists. They were clinical microbiologists, and I think that's good because they could see bacteriology, they could see resistance developing. So they were the ones who first sounded the alarm bells for the problem of antimicrobial resistance. So we, we know that infection control started off, one of the main aims was trying to reduce antibiotic resistance and the other aims were to try and protect healthcare workers. So you can think that around the time of 1970s was the idea of resistance developing. Around 1980s, because of HIV AIDS, the concept of protection of healthcare worker then developed. So I think 1980s was probably the awakening for many institutions that the concept of infection control needed to grow. Since then, of course, it has evolved even more, such that we no longer just try to control the next step of of course, now we add the P, which is prevention. So now we're trying to go upstream a bit. In, instead of waiting for transmission of infection to occur, we're now trying to look at prevention, right? Prophylaxis, trying to do, take measures to try and prevent infection in the first place. So I think that's been the main things that have evolved. And if you think about infection control as an entity, it's only been like less than 30, 30 years or so. Initially, infection control people, as I say, could have been microbiologists. In many hospitals, when ministry first told us to form infection control committees, um, the leads were actually not infectious disease people because there were no such entity at that time. Some of them were microbiologists, some of them just senior physicians or surgeons in hospitals. It's a dangerous thing to ask me because I can talk for a very long time about SARS. Um, what were the concepts for ID and infection control? First, of course, as an infectious disease physician, it brought to me, as well as to my colleagues, very clearly the concept that the field is evolving and continues to evolve. Where else many people had thought of it as you know, infectious diseases, old and dead, you know, what more can we do? And 2003, I think, was a very, very important lesson for all of us that things are evolving all the time. This was only four years after Nipah. And uh, it brought to our minds very, very clearly the sudden realisation that there are still many things cooking and evolving out there. So in a way, it was a, a shock, but it was a very important lesson that things are never going to stay the same. They're going, always going to keep on changing. And I think history has shown that in the last 12 years, this has continued to evolve. You know, every time we thought that we had just uh, recovered from one outbreak of a new disease, we are already preparing for another one. And I think that's what we have told our juniors, that be prepared for a new disease because you know, things are evolving all the time. And this concept of uh, One Health, that uh, we can get diseases from zoonosis, animals, etc. around us, uh, will obviously show that many potential, the potential for many new diseases appearing and affecting us will continue to, to grow. As an infection control person, I think SARS as a new disease and because the first time we knew about it was when it infected our own healthcare workers. And you suddenly are woken up by the idea that it's not enough just to know something about diseases. Immediately you have to come up with some plan to protect your healthcare workers, you know, your own colleagues. And um, because it was a completely new, novel pathogen, we have to scramble around to come up with our own protective recommendations. And the people forget, of course, people forget that at the time that we reacted, it was before there were any international recommendations. 
So I think when it comes to a new disease, what we learned and certainly what we practiced was that we just had to think on our feet and just go with the most, um, the greatest protection that was practical and was something that we could roll out immediately. And I think, I think for a novel pathogen, we cannot be, um, we cannot be paralyzed by indecision and we cannot be paralyzed by not knowing what the recommendations are because there were none in the first few days of, of SARS. So we had to think on our feet uh, and with great gratitude to my colleagues, both in infectious disease as well as infection control, uh, we really managed to, to pull it off. Much, much to our, uh, our you know, relief and satisfaction because at the same time, we, we were actually hearing stories about the things that were going on in some of the other countries at the same time. So we, we really were very thankful that we managed to uh, come up with appropriate recommendations. And we managed to protect our staff. After the initial first couple of weeks, we were fine. We had no more healthcare workers down. I think when H1N1 appeared, and then this was six years after SARS, because of our success in SARS, and this was a national success, it's not just Tanto Singh. It's a nat because of the, the national success and what we achieved in a very short time, the initial reaction was to do the same thing. And I think there's a natural reaction because you tend to use a successful model or a plan to apply it to other conditions. And I think very quickly, some of us realized and recognized that this was going to be different. And I, I think we, we adapted, um, but this was different also in the sense that because it had started from another continent, we had months to prepare for it, and we had months to learn about recommendations, so we didn't invent our own. And that's a plus or minus, because, because there were so-called gold standard recommendations by international authorities. Even though we thought that things could be done differently, we, in a way, dared not do something different. So there was a difference uh, with, between the two uh, outbreaks. The, the other thing, of course, about H1N1 was that um, we soon realised that it was not as lethal as what it had been made up to be. And that, you know, that changed. But I think some things were the same. So in a way, the, the way that the whole infection control unit, infectious disease department, the whole hospital could be mobilised to react to this external threat um, was done very, very well in a, in a sense that we had used 2003 model to be able to, to mobilize and activate in a similar way. And that, that has become something that um, we do for almost every other external threat now. It's something that many people from other centers come to meet us to try and uh, understand uh, how we did it. It's not something that you could write down like a recipe book and say this is what we did because you, you almost have to have been through, through it. But we, we try and, and share our lessons with the various visitors about you know, how, how we mobilize and activate. Let's start with MERS. For MERS, I, when we realize that it is a coronavirus, which means it's the same family as SARS. The initial thoughts, obviously, would be that the transmission method, as well as the prevention uh, recommendation, would probably be similar to SARS. So, I mean, it seems logical. So, I think we be activated more or less in the same way. And by now, I think our medical, nursing, uh, allied health, operation staff are very, very used to knowing when to switch from non-outbreak to outbreak, that it's, it's, was relatively easy. The second thing about MERS, which is different from SARS, so although we say, you know, transmission, probably the same, 
prevention, probably also the same. Uh, between nine, 2003 and now, uh, it's like been almost nine years because when MERS appeared was 2012. Um, in a way, facilities have been upgraded. We actually had much better facilities in terms of infrastructure compared to 2003 where we really had to do almost instant makeshift renovations to try and cope. By 2012, we had much better infrastructure. I, the other thing for MERS, of course, is that it's not short and sharp. Unlike SARS, it was over for us within about two months. MERS has been rumbling for three years. So, in a way, the difference has been that we needed endurance rather than knowing what to do. I think people more or less know what to do. Uh, the policies and protocols have all been in place. What has been the lesson for us, for MERS, is that you need to switch to a, a different setting. You have to do it almost like a rumbling, it almost be like, a, like a recurrent or chronic threat rather than sudden, suddenly something short and sharp that's over in a short while. So in that sense, then, you cannot keep on high alert for such a long time. You can be on high alert only for a short while, but you cannot be on high alert for three years. Obviously, become people become exhausted. So in a way, we have learned to tune down, in a way, to a slightly lower level of preparedness, to be tuned up when necessary. So it's almost like volume control on a player, for example. You, you should know how to turn up and turn down. And, and I think some of our colleagues in the emergency department have been fantastic. They know how to, to switch on and switch off. Because we are looking at an endurance game now. Ebola is, again, something very different because it suddenly appears um, as a threat to us only last year. Although it's been a disease that's been around for many decades, for a few of us, we always thought that we would never have to face the threat of Ebola, of course. Yet another lesson for me and my colleagues is that never say never to any infectious disease threat around the world because by the fact that we all connected so much by air travel links, um, we must always be open to the fact that any disease can come to Singapore. Simply because someone carrying some disease can get on a plane and reach us. So I think Ebola was a very, very good lesson for us that we should never shut our minds to the fact that we can potentially be threatened by a disease that a lot of us never thought we would have to face in our lifetimes. And Ebola was good in the sense that we had to switch on even higher levels of protection and, and um, we, we had to ramp up in many, many ways much, much more than any of the other infectious disease uh, threats that we had. Aside from new pathogens that may strike us, and I, I think that the way we should prepare should be that we need to be open to the idea that new diseases may and can hit us because of zoonosis, and uh, importation. And I think that as a, as a department, as a hospital, as a country, we are very, very well trained and capable of reacting to such sudden threats. What I see as possibly no less important as an infectious disease threat is other diseases that are sort of slowly taking hold in our healthcare setting. And of course, I'm think, talking about multi-drug resistant organisms for which, you know, there, there is also anxiety and a lot of work being done as well, for which we should probably spend no less effort and resources when compared to, say, novel pathogens. I think novel pathogens, everyone's very prepared to throw a lot of resources at them. But we shouldn't forget that there are other things that are rumbling in the background, likely to increase. And, and uh, I, that would be very, very um, sad if we spend a lot of effort against a normal pathogen which never hits us. 
and forget about other things which are actually already present in our, in our healthcare setting. I think for me, aspirations for infectious disease in Singapore would be greater attention to be paid to the issue of antibiotic resistance and multi-drug resistant organisms. And to be, I would, I would like it to be considered a um, public health issue of importance for which I would relatively urgent action should be done rather than let it continue to to carry on and, and fester. So to me, I would put that as something of high importance. And it should receive no less attention than that of a normal pathogen. So that, that would be for my aspiration for infectious disease. I think every time there's a normal pathogen, a lot of effort and resources are spent on diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, but I think enough attention should also be given to the issue of antibiotic resistance because that is a threat. Perhaps it will not be something explosive like needs to happen in 2016, but certainly something that is rumbling along and it's going to be a very, very big issue. Some, it's already been recognised as a problem internationally. I think I would think that in Singapore, a little bit more attention should be paid for that. One of my greatest satisfactions has been to see the growth of the specialty from the time when there's only like one or two persons in the country to now, we now have a good uh, number of people and because we have enough people who are interested in the specialty, we can now see them differentiating and diverting in their interests whereas previously we are jack or jill of all trades trying to cover all aspects of infectious diseases now we have people who have Know, specialty interests, say in uh, HIV AIDS, there are other people who are interested in intensive care infections, there are people who are interested in emerging infectious diseases, travel medicine. So it has been very, very fulfilling and satisfying to find younger, more people interested in the specialty, such that we have grown to a, a strength in numbers that we can allow, we can have people diversifying and developing their own subspecialty interests.